Okay, so um, we are starting week five. We're on midterm week. The midterm is open. It's 25 questions, multiple choice. The midterm is based on the PowerPoint slides that are posted in the module and the weekly lecture material. The module are from the American Hotel Motel Association safety and security training class. And that's where the midterm questions are written from. So if you have any um, questions after you take the exam, please email me and I'll take a look at the any questions that you have. Uh, this evening, we're going to review the Hyatt Regency uh, walkway collapse. And I also have a video pertaining to that walkway collapse. And the reason why we're studying this video is not to look into the construction or the engineering aspect of it, but the hotel was open. There was an event going on and people were at the event when this collapse actually happened. So what would you do if you were the manager on duty, if you were the general manager, assistant GM, how would you react to this major tra tragedy? So that's what we're more looking into for this case study. Uh, Wednesday, I'll just be touching base with you to review, making sure you got everything done for the midterm. Uh, next week is Thanksgiving week. There will be no classes uh, next week, no class scheduled uh, next week. Uh, I will be out of town traveling. I already got this approved from the people above. So there is no classes next week. So make sure you all understand that. I will also send out uh, an email. All right, so the first thing I wanna do, I wanna share the screen and go over the case study with you for this week. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're looking at here is the higher Regency walkway uh, collapse. The case study um, was written in 207, but the actual event of the collapse happened in 1980. And the stories that are discussed uh, that were later done by 2020, which we're gonna watch here in a few minutes, um, was in 1981. So in Kansas City, Missouri, the higher Regency opened for booking, boasting one of its base uh, biggest themes was the suspended walkway going out to the atrium. And directly underneath the atrium was a conference room, a convention center where they were having events. Um, so the hotel opened, brand new hotel, um, featuring this big 64,000 pound bridge walkway, which connected a third floor to the atrium to the convention center. Um, so there was an actual event going on. So read through this particular case study. And as I stressed, the case study is not to see if the engineers um, did things wrong or built things wrong. The case study is more to review in a risk assessment, how would you have handled it if you were the manager on duty? The walkway collapsed, people were pinned, they were crushed, people got killed. This happened right in the middle of an event in the hotel. So if you were the manager on duty or if you were the banquet manager or staff, how would you actually handle this particular situation? All right, so read through the case study and then getting down to the bottom, uh, 114 people were killed, uh, 200 uh, were injured. Uh, There's 18 pairs of husbands of wives that were killed, some mothers, fathers. Uh, were killed together. Um, they started this construction in 1978, so it drug out for two years. Uh, so what you want to do is go through the, the root cause is right here. Uh, the collapse was unexpected. Um, The structural fail, failure. 
And then down at the bottom, here's some discussion questions after you read through it. When did the Hyatt collapse? Who built the Hyatt Regency walkway? Who were the Hyatt Regency guests on the walkway and what events were they attending? What major business goals of the Hyatt Regency were impacted? How did the walkway collapse affect customer service? How did the walkway collapse affect the production schedule of the hotel? What this means, they had future bookings. So all those future bookings, future sales were canceled. People canceled the event. They didn't want to be at the hotel. They didn't want to be anywhere near that property. Um, could have higher regency prevented the collapse? Did they have any influence on that? If you read through the case study, higher regency was pushing the contractors to get this project completed and open so they could start gaining sales. This particular time in the 80s, Hyatt Regency was considered the five-star hotel company of all hotels. It was the hotel company. Then, they, then you will drill down and find out what caused the collapse. Okay, how much money did Hyatt Regency loss or lose? I mean, they lost money in future bookings. They lost money in lawsuits. Uh, your insurance only covers so much in risk assessment. Then the corporation starts to have the going out of pocket. Think of all the victims who were killed. I think the, uh, the families that lost, uh, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, spouses, et cetera. So look through and, and drill down on that because it's very important to understand when you make decisions that a, as a general manager and you're in a property where people are supposed to be safe, um, your decisions could affect lives. Okay. Um, what happened to the walkway and when did the re uh, high regency reopen? Um, anyone have any questions on this particular case study? Week five case study. Any questions on this? Yeah, on the Hyatt case study, we yeah. answered the questions at the end of it in the statement as how we would have handled it as the general manager. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I, I know um, when you read through it, you're going to find out who is at fault. Not really trying to look at who is, who is at fault. The, the situation is the bridge collapsed. There was an event going on underneath the bridge. There was people on the bridge going to another event. Let's say you're just behind the front desk. You're booking people in. The next thing, all of a sudden, this collapse ha happens. What would your reaction be? What's your risk management strategy or plan? And when you read through the case study, you can read through. There's a lot of information on the Internet about it. Uh, I'm going to show a video also from Hugh Downs on 2020. Okay. So you're correct. Yeah, on that. And um, most of the answers are up above in the case study. I wrote these discussion questions to help you pull out some scenarios. And just know that this is only one type of uh, an event that's happened. Um, there are many events since then that have happened. And we all know. Uh, pool accidents. Um, there have been other walkways and a few other areas that have collapsed. And just take some of the case studies we're talking about recently and um, like the Las Vegas shooting and things like that. These are all similarities that you're the GM on duty and next thing you know, all these things are happening. Any other questions, comments on the case study? Questions, comments? Okay, so I'm going to show you the uh, video. Make sure your volume is turned all the way up because it's a little bit low. I have it all the way up and mine's all the way up, but in case you have a hard time hearing it. Good evening, I'm Hugh Down, and this is 2020. <laughs> On the ABC News Magazine, 2020, tonight. I had to let a few people die in order that others might live who were going to die no matter what I did. A tea dance, and they were happy. Then, two walkways collapsed, and there was tragedy. Tonight, from Kansas City, Tom Gerald with the story of 12 horrifying hours of agony and heroism in a moment of crisis. Up front tonight, remarkable heroism in a disaster in Kansas City. At 7 o'clock in the evening last Friday, a tea dance was being held in the big open lobby at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. Hundreds of couples were dancing. 
many of them on these walkways, suspended above the floor. The highest walkway suddenly dropped onto the lowest, and the combined mass of steel and concrete then dropped to the dancers beneath. 111 people died. 188 were injured. When a community is hit suddenly with an overwhelming disaster, how does it react? Well, in this case, with unstinting energy and heroism, Tom Jarrell has been in Kansas City this week covering this story. Tom? Hugh, by now this city's day of sorrow has been well documented in the daily news reports of body counts and the almost frenzied search for what went wrong. But we found much more here, not yet fully told. It's a story of a horrible tragedy laced with magnificent heroism. This was a test of human ingenuity under the ultimate deadline of death. Events here in Kansas City tested the strongest of human instincts to the limit, the desire to live and to save lives. It brought together men, women, and children whom we shall meet in their moment of crisis, involving the pain of injury, the certainty of death, and perhaps that most dreaded of all human experiences, being hopelessly, hopelessly trapped alive. Friday night on the town, the popular tea dance at the end place, the modern Hyatt Hotel. The big band music of the 40s. This was middle age, middle income, middle America, out for a night of good fun and companionship. It was a real nice way to spend the Friday evening. Big band, and, and uh, you meet a lot of your friends. It's, it's very nice. Edward Summons, survivor, whose life, along with the lives of hundreds of others, would be in the hands of people they never knew. Some were still at work while the late afternoon tea dance was still underway. Breaking concrete on a construction job nearby, Country Bill Allman, a jackhammer operator. Fireman Mike Trader and Roger Tudor, rescue specialist who ride a hook and ladder. Dr. Joe Wackerly at Baptist Hospital was just finishing duty in the emergency room. Heavy duty crane operator Chad Hinckley and liquor store owner Frank Hashman. While they were elsewhere, the colorful balloons floated skyward at the tea dance up toward those special aerial walkways. Crowds had begun to gather on them to watch the swirling <coughs> partners directly below. The dancers were wrapped up in the music and each other. Eugene Jeter and his bride Karen had been married only two weeks and showed Well, I saw some friends there. I saw uh, Jeter there on Wall Street. Yep. That's, Jeter started the business and was leaving. Yeah. Uh, they were killed. The music and life for many of the dancers <coughs> came to an end when two crowded overhead walkways caved in. In an instant, tons of concrete and steel had buried hundreds, killing most, but trapping scores of survivors deep beneath two layers of twisted rubble. Come to the Hyatt Regency immediately. Three survivors just fell in. Three what? Three survivors and only people from the third floor fell and crushed. Okay. Immediately. Hyatt Regency? Hyatt Regency immediately. All right. As that first call to the fire department went out, there was mass confusion, but those not injured rushed forward to help. Businessmen, busboys, hotel guests. Ignoring the possible danger of further collapse, they administered to the injured. The first professionals on the scene immediately radioed for more help. We're all going to die, Reason Six. The bomb is crashed, there may be 50 to 100 people. Oh, Jesus, yeah. And we need something that can lift, table, pen, fire department, people are trapped underneath the bathroom. The worst hurt were choppered out. I remember crying because I hurt so bad inside. <clears throat> not being able to, to do more with what I had. Neither the forklifts already at the scene nor the fire department's heaviest lift equipment was adequate to reach the trap. The horror struck me as I seen people laying there, smashed underneath this tons of steel, and knowing, knowing that we probably would not be able to lift it with what equipment that we had. As bulldozers ripped out the hotel entryway, heavy cranes parked at the construction site nearby were brought up. Operator Chet Hinckley smashed out the front hotel windows to get his crane into position over the rescue site. His machine was the only thing powerful enough to raise the 10-ton slabs covering the victims. Moving uh, these slabs was uh, something that 
it could uh you know you don't know what's under there and outside of the people that was trapped you don't know what kind of a structure the rest of the building was in it could have all fallen into the basement for all we know so we just had to go slow and easy the doctor came up and i'm sorry i don't know his name because the man was a very brave man and he he asked me if i go underneath with him and we went in between the two steel beams and he would tell me which ones were dead and which one were alive that doctor was emergency room physician Joe Wackerly, who had arrived at the scene to team up with the firemen. As we went around, we found the pockets of people, some most dead, uh, some alive, some barely alive. He would go down in the hole with the people and assess their injuries and even at times resetting their bones there in the hole before they brought them out. I had to dismember some bodies to get some other bodies, get some live people out. And I had to let a few people die in order that others might live who were going to die no matter what I did. Every place you looked, there was pieces <clears> of <throat> bodies. There was there was things, blood running out all in different areas. And it was horrible to me. Trapped amongst the dead were many still living. Regina Weir and nine others were in a pocket of debris where they would remain for eight hours. I couldn't see two inches in front of my face. All I could hear were moanings and screamings. Somebody was... Over me was his feet up against my right shoulder, which was uh, his, apparently he was hurt bad paralyzed. The rescuers started drilling a hole right above me, and they were able to cut it out and pull me out eventually. They were able to reach through that hole, and luckily I had on my jacket, and several hands just grabbed that jacket, and, and then they never let go. <laughs> They just kept tugging. Not as fortunate was Jeff Durham, a bartender. Pinned by steel beams across his legs, he was alive but sinking fast. Drastic measures were called for. I had made the decision that the man would not live much longer and that if he, if he wanted to have the chance to live, we were going to have to take his leg off. I saw him laying there, and they were putting the IVs, one in each arm, and they said, will you hold me? And I did. I said, uh, you your leg is not salvageable, probably, even if we could get it off of you, and I don't think we can get you out, and you're not going to live otherwise. And um, I have to look at some other people, so why don't you think about that? I never dreamed that I could stand and watch a man's leg being cut off. The leg was amputated, but Jeff Durham died. By now, the rescue teams were drained by the carnage. But as they methodically went about their jobs, a voice from below restoked their emotions. We were told by the chief to see if we could find anybody alive underneath the first layer. And so we started going around the base next to the floor, hollering, and to see if we could get anybody to answer us. Every once in a while, they would ask us to be still so they could listen. And they knelt down and they could hear this, this voice from underneath and knew or thought that it was a young, a young child. I heard the little boy yelling for help, and he, uh, he wanted to get out. He was completely enclosed in concrete and steel. There was maybe at most an inch between the steel and the floor on the bottom. Trapped at the deepest level beneath tons of debris was 11-year-old Dalton Grant lying next to his mother. I was in the dark, and I was sort of in the splits with my knees up to my chin, and um, I thought it was a dream. I didn't think this something that bad could happen to me. I thought it was a dream. Now, I kept asking my mom, is this a dream? I came upon Dalton and his mother. They were, they were, it was interesting uh, because they were both in the fetal position, tucked up like this. I think they were facing each other, and they couldn't move because they were locked in each other with a dead person over them this way, a dead person on each of them behind them. My foot was caught under the balcony. It's about three tons on one foot, and the other foot was um, being pushed down by the bottom of the balcony, and I couldn't stretch it out because there was a corpse right under it. I lay down and started talking to him, uh, explaining what was going on, what we were and asked him his name and how old he was. And uh, he told me he was 11 years old. And it struck me at the time because my own son was 11. It was all right. It 
didn't, so it was pretty bad now. I was just saying, Mom, are we going to die? And I, I, I didn't know what to do, and I thought, I thought we were going to die. He just wanted out. He was begging to get out. It was really scary because I couldn't actually see the bodies. I could just feel the wet, the wet hair on the lady and the guy's shoe, and his ankle was really wet, and I didn't know what, if it was blood or water. For five hours, Dalton lay trapped with his mother, occasionally squeezing her hand for comfort. Neither was aware that above them, Country Bill had arrived with his jackhammer. The doctor was over there, and uh, me and him, me and him and the other guy, we was trying to make a hole to get his head down in there so he can talk to the people down underneath. I heard jackhammers and saws and axes. So we got part of a hole built and chipped out with a jackhammer, 95-pound jackhammer, headed out. I thought that the hole was going to come through right over me. They might hit me with a jackhammer. Well, he was jackhammering over their heads. And when he was jackhammering over their heads, he was yelling out that uh, I'm down here and you're jackhammering over our heads. I was in the dark so long when I looked up at all the light and the strange faces. Like every new face I see, it's not like it's real. I said, hi, I'm Dr. Joe. And, and uh, what's your name? And we, you know, Dalton. And uh, because I had to find out, I was down there with him. We had to find out what was going on. And, what way he was, and I talked to his mom, and I talked to him. Dr. Joe, Country Bill, and the fireman got the boy out seven hours after he was in two. When they pulled him out, everybody started clapping my hands. When the people come out, the little boy and the mother, we just plotted. I don't understand why, but we applauded. It was, it was so exhilarating. There was one life saved after all the bodies that we'd seen. This is another life that was saved. Do a personal note in closing. Kansas City can be proud of the way its people handled this disaster. Ordinary people were called upon time and time again to perform extraordinary deeds. They did, and did them well. Thank you, Tom. Incidentally, that exclusive footage of the tea dance and the immediate aftermath of the disaster was shot by KMBC cameraman David Forsting. Okay, so um, everyone understand the case study for uh, week five. Uh, I showed the video based on the case study. Um, what would you do if you're the general manager on property? How would you handle this? Um, just answer through some of the questions at the end and read through it. Uh, as we've seen in modern times, we've had 9-11. The top of 9-11 was the, there were restaurants, uh, many, chefs, servers, and people at 9-11 were killed during that time period. So there's a lot of things that have happened in modern times that we have to really be aware of. Uh, and the class is called safety and security and risk assessment. So we have to take precautions and know and have these plans in place because we know these things are gonna happen. Or if they do happen, how do we react to them? And it should be automatic. It shouldn't be everybody looking at each other like deer in headlight. You should have a quick strategy and everybody reacts. Any questions on midterm, this week's case study? Anyone, any questions on anything? Midterm grades are due Friday, so everything needs to be submitted uh, Friday by 5 p.m. Wednesday, when we meet for class, I'll touch base with you and just see where everyone's at. Questions on anything, anyone? Please make sure that you post in the chat room. That's how I take attendance. Um, if you don't have anything for the remainder of the class, um, the midterm is due, the case study is due, everything is due by Friday. Even though I put Monday for the case study, please turn it in for Friday because it is a uh, midterm assignment. Any questions, anyone? That's all I have for you for this evening. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. All right, we'll see you all tomorrow.